as you've heard, auras are very important in communication and also in attracting energies and working with energies. I would like to talk now about two very special cases for which auras are also used quite often. And those two cases are vampirism and seduction. The reason I'm taking both of them together is that they're actually a little bit similar. <coughs> So if we look at vampirism, vampirism is the taking of energy. So one person has a parasitical relationship with the other person. And often to be able to uh, take the energy from the other person, their aura needs to be in a very specific state. <coughs> so there are several requirements for a vampiric connection. One of them is of course that there is a connection. Often uh, the most usual thing is that vampirism is determined by proximity. If you're in contact with the person's aura or very close to the person's aura, so with a little bit of reshaping, a little tentacle which that aura can form, they can make contact with your aura. Vampirism can also occur at greater distances. When the person is in a way thinking of you and often they will use an item of you or a picture of you or something else to focus their attention on you and on your energy to connect to your energy. When vampirism occurs at a greater distance <coughs> there's usually only the outer edges of the aura which are involved so there's less energy loss as when you're in actual close proximity to the person. Energy moves very naturally from uh, where there is a lot to where there isn't so much. It also tends to move from high to low. <coughs> so it is very similar to water and you can see yourself as a balloon but if that balloon suddenly finds itself into a va in a vacuum then a lot more air will try to rush out to expand to leave the balloon and when there is a normal amount of counter pressure and there's kind of an equilibrium and the balloon will stay the same size. And vampirism works in the same way. So other energies which are in a way nourishing or supporting to the person might be removed or displaced and a kind of an energetic vacuum is employed so that the energy will rush out of the person's aura and Ultimately, because the aura is emptying itself, it also will start to empty the body, because the body is replenishing the aura. And even the spirit, because the spirit is also replenishing the aura. So, vampirism can have a lot of effects, primarily on the aura, secondarily on the body, and last but not least, even on the spirit itself. So, to have a functional uh, vampiric aura, the vibration needs to be relatively low and the amount of energy which is there, at least in the part which makes contact to the other person, also needs to be quite low. So in a way you are showing weakness, but that weakness is also your weapon, is your strength. So often people who have a vampiric aura, they take on a victim role. They feel um, sad, they feel depressed, um, they feel sick. Um, and in some way they are depressing their own energies, both in vibrational level and in amount. And by doing so, they can absorb energies of other people who are in a higher state. And ultimately these people, both as a result of the energy being removed and as a defensive reaction, will also go into a similar state. Because if two people are equally depressed, and have equal lack of energy and equally low energies, also you stop the energy loss. So depression, um, fear, um, anger can also be very much defensive adaptations which happen if you are in the presence of a vampiric person. So often you may find that you are in a way considering your own reactions to be 
um, ungrateful or unnatural because this person is suffering, they're in pain, they need your help and you feel anger or resentment or an unwillingness to be around them and you can think, oh how cruel of me, how harsh of me that I'm not yeah, being more kind, more open-hearted towards this person but I'm, that I'm actually repulsed by them and I loathe them uh, but this is basically just a self-protection instinct so it is good to see that not everybody who is in a state of depression is a vampire either. There is always this tendency of the energy to flow from high to low, but what makes a person a vampire is basically that they are gluttons, that even though they receive energy it is not really actively changing them, they are not using it, using the opportunity to climb higher. So for instance if a person is sick and they're not a vampiric person and you go to visit them and you bring them some, something nice to eat, you go for a little walk, um, you cheer them up with the latest gossip, uh, then afterwards you may feel that your energy is slightly depleted by having spent time with somebody whose energy is at a lower level than yours, but the other person's energy should have been improved by the same amount as you have lost, or even more, because you are having a stimulating influence, which allows the life force of the person to work better. And So you could say it's almost an investment. You give one unit of energy, and the other person gets that one unit of energy, but that one unit of energy also creates more energy generation. So the other person might end up with one and a half units of energy. So you could say it's a good investment, especially if you have this mutual treaty where you support each other, then both of you get stronger and you will get more out of the relationship than either of you is putting in. Unfortunately, with the parasitic person, the opposite is true. Uh, the more you put in, the more is demanded of you. So somehow you're getting thanks and recognition on a maybe a verbal level, that they're praising you for coming, that they're happy that you're here, but ultimately their energetic state is not changing, and therefore so they will keep on draining energies. And actually, actually you will find that the energetic state of the person you visit is not increased by the same amount of energy you invested in them, but actually much less, because they are resisting being uplifted by being uplifted they would use, lose their ability to feed themselves. So the difference here is also in how they use energy. Typically when a person is given an amount of energy this stimulates them. So they become more active and they react by generating energy themselves. So you give them something, they become active, they create energy. But with the vampiric person you give them something and they don't really become active, they don't really use the energy. And the result is that the energy is absorbed because these are people who are not generating a lot of energy themselves. Uh, sometimes they don't know how to or sometimes they just find it easier to be a parasitical creature. And then um, the energy you give to them is largely absorbed to yeah, maintain their life processes. So you give them one unit of energy, well about three quarters of it is usually absorbed straight away, uh, so they only are left with one quarter. So there is some improvement in their condition, because otherwise also people would feel it's completely useless to visit them. But the improvement will be much less than your investment. And also it will require almost a continuous flow of energy to keep them at that level rather than a one shot which will actually last them for quite a while because their own energy generation will have been stimulated. Generally people who are vampiric in nature they don't realize it about themselves. They are not actively hunting for people with very high energies or very high vibration. They often see themselves as victims, they have a poor me syndrome. Um, 
you know, usually not also attracted to people who have a lot of energy or who are very successful um, because then the difference is too great. They cannot create a good connection with them. Because if a person has always yeah, met with success and is in a very high state, then uh, even though theoretically they could get a lot of energy from them, they are so different in themselves, there are so little uh, similarity between them and their victims that they find it hard to connect and therefore hard to drain. So they're usually looking for, you could say, fellow victims, people who have also suffered, who can sympathize with their suffering, sympathize with their pain, um, and who they can, in a way, offer an exchange to, like let's talk about our problems, let's help each other, we are the same, we are similar, we have similar troubles, similar pain. And you will find that usually these vampiric people, they are in a way victims, preying on other victims. So these people tend to enjoy being in victim groups, they like going to um, yeah, mutual support meetings, um, places like this, so they can meet other people who have a similarly low vibration but slightly more energy and it's very very easy to connect to them and very very easy to draw their attention to themselves because it is also by drawing attention that they get the person to focus their energy on them and by drawing their attention, also they draw the focus, and where the focus goes, where the attention goes, is also where the energy goes. So if I pay attention to an energetic vampire, I will lose a lot more energy than when I'm ignoring them. So often, these vampiric people will also do things to draw attention. Um, if they're women, they tend to uh, dress very uh, stylishly, very um, sexually provocative, um, or to behave in a provocative manner uh, in a, with a very distinct style. If they're men, they're often a little boorish or loud or um, obtrusive. Because even if you act in a way which irritates other people, you draw attention. And by drawing attention, you get what you need, you get what you want. So, it is hard to, um, to spot a vampire if you don't know what you're looking for. And even if you do know what you're looking for, uh, it can be very hard to defend yourself against them. Because you, the simplest defense is, of course, to go on a level even lower than them, and then you can suck back your energy or... Uh, prevent at least your own energy from being taken by them. But it also means a sacrifice. You cannot stay your normal, happy, healthy self in a very high vibration if you're around them. But it is important to note that while your energy may have a natural tendency to flow into them, the energy is still under your control. So you can by your intention, tell your energy not to do that or to come back to you. Um, the other thing you can do is try to uh, connect the person to another energy source rather than yourself or another person. So you can try to get them to, for instance, uh, pray or to meditate or to uh, visit places where there is a lot of energy available. So. If such a person would live on a ley line or another place which has a lot of earth energy, um, they could also exist without having to trouble anybody. Similarly to places where there is a lot of energy released. So usually, usually places where their uh, prayers are performed or meditations are performed or where there's a lot of emotion. Um, so you could go to uh, a disco or any place where they have performances. There tends to be a lot of spare energy lying around, emotional energy being around. Um, more even than one vampire can suck up. If you go to like a soccer match, 
where there's thousands of people cheering, being excited about it. An energetic vampire can eat their fill and yeah, there will still be plenty of energy left. So these are also ways you can teach people who have such a vampirical nature um, to change their lifestyle a little bit so they don't need to prey on the people around them as much. So this brings me to the second subject, namely seduction. And seduction works in a very similar way. Seduction is also about drawing the attention of the other person so that the energy goes towards you. But rather than sucking away the energy which is uh, being given to you, it is about stimulating the person to give more energy to you. And you might think like, gosh, but it's just like vampirism, like the person is getting more and more energy to go to them. Yes, this is true. And in the same way it can also be very exhilarating and very flattering and energizing if a person is madly in love with you and chasing you and dreaming about you and very enthusiastic about meeting you. It's a catchy thing. It's exhilarating. And it's exhilarating for you know, often both parties. So in the same way often in seduction works by the uh, person in way, creating energetic space. They put themselves into a receptive role. They welcome the other person's energy so that the energy, other, the energy of the other person will kind of naturally flow into their aura, into their space. But rather than in way, removing the energy, absorbing it and taking it away again, it is made welcome. So I, in a way, open my doors um, for another person's aura energy to come in. And once it is in, I stimulate it. I say like, gosh, it is nice to feel you, it is great that you are here. Um, how wonderful to meet you, um, things like this. And the other person will focus more attention on me and um, I will reward that focus of attention by yeah, stimulating them even more. So it is often an art of giving a little um, and out of that little comes a reaction. So the art of seduction is usually you make yourself relatively passive but you do a little bit just to make the other person more and more active to in a way, accelerate their, their energy flow. Um, so you're in a way, instead of just stealing the energy, you're getting the other person to create energy and to project it towards you. So the other person is not suffering from seduction, but you are in a way trapping their attention or becoming the focus of their attention. And you're also of course benefiting by all this energy flowing to you. So being a seductress or a seductor is also very pleasant energetically, it is very exhilarating. You get lots of energy from other people and other people enjoy giving it to you, you enjoy getting it, so it's more of a mutual high which you are creating. To work with seduction it's also very important to um, be sensitive to the other person's needs and desires. Often a person has a, a desire to develop themselves or to be nourished or recognized or supported in something which they're not. So it's about seeing the need and filling the need. And if you can do that, it is very easy to seduce. Because everybody has needs, everybody has things they desire or want or crave. And being a good seductress, you can feel exactly what that need is. Does the person need to be praised? Does the person need to be cared for? Does the person need to be um, dominant? <laughs> or would the person like to be more submissive? And you, in a way, cater to their needs. And you welcome their needs because often people are very nervous about their own needs. 
needs are generally felt as weaknesses, like what? But I shouldn't want that, I should be able to do without praise or without attention or um, without uh, all these dependencies upon the other person. So people tend to be very nervous about their needs, they tend to see them as weaknesses. But if another person is welcoming your need, is enthusiastic about it and is really, you could almost say, worshipping you because of your need, then it is great because finally your hidden repressed part uh, can manifest itself. And this often gives a sensation which is very euphorical. Um, and it's very pleasant uh, to allow your like caged needs out of their out of their small confinement and uh, really to feed. So this is how often seduction works. In seduction, it's also important that there is a very measured response. So seduction is not surrendering to the other person. It is allowing them into your mental space, it is allowing them into your emotional space, not necessarily your physical space. But you need to give both a mental and a physical and uh, an emotional response to their energies. And this is often an interplay, because the person will try to gauge what you're like, what you like, what you dislike, to find out if they're welcome or not. They're looking for your traumas, your blockages, your, uh, your filters, which will say no to them. And will, when they meet a no, they will find out, like, oh, I shouldn't share too much, I shouldn't go any further. So what you need to be able to be a good seducer is the ability to move aside your own traumas, your own filters, and really to be able to accept the other person and to meet their need. If they need you to be masculine, be masculine. If they need you to be feminine, be feminine. If you, they need you to be emotional, be emotional. If they need you to be strong, be strong. So seduction does require uh, a lot of skill from the seducer, much more than vampirism does. So to be a seducer, you don't have to give a lot of it but you have to be able to give some of what the other person wants. Um, because also if you satisfy the other person's need, then they will find another need and they will move away from you, who is identified with that need, and then will move to somebody who can, ident can fulfill the other need, which is now their primary need. So to keep a seduction going, you want to keep the person hungry. So you want to feed them little tidbits, but, yeah, not stuff them. And by being constantly tantalized, you could say, and occasionally they get a larger bite, they keep on following, they keep being enthralled, they keep being seduced. And ultimately people can really become slaves to the person who seduces them. Because this person is generating such a euphoria, it is such a, um, you could say, um, a paradise for them to be acknowledged, to be near them, that they will do almost anything for the person they are uh, seduced by. So it can really be a, a method of uh, also nourishing yourself by seduction. But here it is not so much as vampirism, where you really um, destroy the person uh, who is feeding you. If you're a seducer or a seductress, you're rather nourishing the person and maintaining also the health and balance of the person who is feeding you. There can still be an imbalance, that you actually give very little compared to what you receive. But what you do give is usually what the other person is lacking. So it is much more of a symbiotic relationship between the seductor and the seductee than there is between the vampire and its prey. 
I hope this has given you some insight into these uh, aura types and will help you to uh, 